everybody. Welcome to the FSHP webinar this evening. My name is Bill Kernan. I am the chair for the Legal and Regulatory Council. And uh, we are bringing you this webinar tonight uh, for FSHP on understanding the new USP 797 guidelines. Um, certainly a very big topic today with the new guidelines becoming, and I learned this term at uh, the ASHP summer meeting, becoming compendiumly applicable. Um, that means they are official for enforcement. So as of November 1st, um, these guidelines will go into effect. So a bunch of changes that everybody will need to understand. And so we really felt like this would be a webinar that was, was very, very useful. Um, the Board of Pharmacy, um, probably about six months ago, actually formed a subcommittee um, where they reviewed the entire USB 797 chapter to look at and evaluate how they are going to be enforcing the new guidelines. That committee had a combination of uh, board of pharmacy members on it, along with other experts from around the state. Uh, and so we are very lucky tonight um, to have Dionysus Avendano, who was one of those experts that sat on that board of pharmacy subcommittee to be presenting with us. Uh, Dionysus is a clinical pharmacy manager at Memorial Hospital Miramar. Uh, she has um, vast experience in hospital pharmacy and clean room and sterile compounding, obviously, um, that she sat uh, on the committee. And then we also have with us um, Ileana Soto, who is the compounding pharmacy supervisor. Uh, she has nearly 20 years of hospital pharmacy and sterile compounding experience and works also at, at Memorial Hospital Miramar, part of the, the greater Memorial Healthcare System in South Broward. So with that, um, I'll turn over to them. Just a few quick things. If you go back one slide, uh, Dionysus, for me. Um, uh, the following uh, webinar is um, accredited for one hour of CE. Everybody who is in attendance um, will be able to get that one hour of CE. Um, you will get emailed a link to the evaluation. You have to complete that evaluation in order to be able to get uh, CE. Um, do allow one to two weeks um, for the CE to be able to be processed, and then you'll be able to see it in CE Broker. And if you have any questions or issues, you can contact that email right there, fshp at fshp.org. Um, so wanted to make sure I get that taken care of first, but now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dionysus. I'll be monitoring the chat, but at the end, um, we'll definitely make sure that we have some time for questions. All right. Um, Dionysus, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Bill, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, we are happy to be here, uh, both Ileana and I, uh, and share this information with uh, everyone online this afternoon. Um, some disclosures, we have no relevant or financial in, uh, relationships or affiliations to any of the materials we're gonna be presenting today. Um, and just to be fair, the changes mentioned in these presentations are not all inclusive. Uh, there's um, definitely a lot more within the chapter. This is just an overview of the changes uh, for you guys today. With this presentation, we hope to illustrate a little bit of history behind the revisions of the United States Pharmacopeia chapters. Uh, what are the major changes or what we think is meaningful from the 2008 version uh, to the 2022 version of USB, which as you all know, will become effective November 1st, 2023. We're here to uh, provide some examples of how we have uh, uh, implemented some changes to become compliant, describe the responsibilities of the designated person, compounding personnel, and pharmacies overseeing the compliance. Some terminology for you this afternoon so you can follow along the presentation. So let's just take it away with a little bit of history about the United States Pharmacopeia. Its origins date back to 1848 when the Drug Information Act was enacted. And the poor officials back at that time will use USB staff to look at uh, the products that were coming up from Europe because they were labeled good enough for America, but we really didn't know uh, if they were effective. 
Since then, USP have become a long way. It is currently the official compendia of the United States, and it publishes both the United States Pharmacopeia and the National Formulary. It's a private, non-governmental institution. It has no enforcement authority. It just presents recommendations. The USPNF monographs, which is what I call a recipe book, delineate compounding requirements for articles. And compliance with this monograph is required and applied to any compounded product marketed in the United States. Their goal is really standardization making sure that if you have a product compounded at pharmacy A, uh, it's the same product that you will receive at another state within the United States. As Bill explained before, chapters below uh, 1000 and applicable and what we call compendially require. If they're referenced in a monograph, if they're referenced in another chapter below 1000 and the perfect example is USB 800, which is mentioned and referenced in USP 797 and 795, or if it's referenced in a general notice. Chapters between 1000 and 1999 are for informational purpose. Remember we said USP has no enforcement authority. So who enforce the chapters? Uh, FDA under the uh, Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act and the adulteration and mismanagement provisions of this law is able to um, implement the chapter. And of course, here in Florida, we do have the Department of Health and the Board of Pharmacy under Administrative Code Rule 64B16-27797, which pretty much has adopted 797. But why is it important to really look at this uh, chapters and comply, right? If you haven't had a chance to uh, read this article from ISMP, I really recommend you do. It's called Sterile Compounding Tragedy, uh, a Symptom of a Broken System on Many Levels. And with this, this publication, you'll find uh, some examples of errors that have occurred uh, throughout the, uh, the states and Unfortunately, the most common one that I can remember now is the one from New England Compounding Pharmacy back in 2012. Uh, and this pharmacy was producing large amounts of methylprednisolone acetate. They were compounding and achieving across the states. Unfortunately, they were not following the full compliance of the chapters. 384 patients uh, contracted fungal meningitis. Some patients died and the pharmacist was prosecuted. So just to let you know the history of 797, it began in 1992 with chapter 1074. So it was informational at that time. In 1995, it became 1206, called sterile drugs products for home use. And then in 2004, it became 797, which again incorporated those previous chapters and became compendially applicable. A new revision uh, went on on 2008, and then now in 2022, which we know will become effective in 2023. So let's talk about what Ileana and I think are meaningful changes. Once again, this uh, presents our own opinions and we really recommend you read the entire chapter for what we think is important. Let's start with the scope. Um, the chapter now talks about alternative technologies. Uh, you can use them. As, uh, as long as they're deemed not inferior, but they cannot be used to alter the beyond new state of the compounding environment. And one of the examples I can think of is uh, there was a time where we were thinking that closed system transfer device could be used to extend the BUD of the products because we thought it would minimize contamination. Well, the chapter is very clear that although you can use these alternative technologies, you cannot use them to extend BUD. The chapter now applies not only to humans, but animals. And again, my bed pharmacies out there, this is a big change for you too. Uh, it clarifies what in, uh, irrigation for internal body cavities are, including pulmonary inhalation, baths, soaks for live organs. Talks about docking and activation of uh, proprietary bags for future activation. So this is more like your at ease, your mini back blows, things of that nature. If you're docking them for future use, that is considered compounding. And repackaging of any conventionally manufactured sterile product is also considered compounding. 
So we're gonna begin with an assessment question just uh, to test your knowledge out there. This is a patient who visits an urgent care center and is diagnosed with community acquired pneumonia. The physician prescri prescribed acetromycin, 500 milligrams, IVP give back one time over one hour. The nurse prepares one dose. It follows the product's labeling recommendations and the labels include reconstitution, further dilution in normal saline, prior to administration, concentration, and storage requirements. Is this considered compounding for the scope of the revised 2022 USP 797? So I'm gonna let you think about this question for a little bit while I show you the packaging star for acetromycin. Uh, so just take a look at it just for a minute. It, um, has how to prepare it, dilution, final infusion solution concentration, and storage. So let's review what the new scope of 797 is. Back in 2008, any products uh, that were uh, coming from the manufacturer and prepared strictly according to the labeling on the manufacturer's instructions was still considered compounding because the labeling did not include all the environmental quality, the storage times, the micro microbiological contamination studies to determine BUD. And we all know that not all labels are created equal. But now in 2022, USP actually aligned with uh, the FDA and preparation for approved labeling is not considered compounding as long as it's a single dose prepared for one patient and the labeling include the diluent that result in strength, the container closure system and the storage time. So this is a big change within the chapter one that we think uh, it's, uh, it's a big change. If you look at the acetromycin package insert, for example, it tells you how to dilute, reconstitute the product. It's telling you also that the final concentration of this reconstitution, it's 100 milligram uh, in one ml, that this reconstitution is stable for 24 hours at room temperature. It actually tells you how to dilute uh, and to a bigger bag of normal saline, um, which are the allowed concentrations, one milligram per ml or two milligrams per ml how you're going to uh, administer this and the storage conditions. So under the definition of the FDA of approved uh, per, uh, labeling for one individual patient, we believe that this is not considered compounding, but it's not as simple as that. You, we have to be very careful how this is applied. Uh, make sure that the labeling actually has all the components required by USP to be to not be considered compounding. Another big <laughs> change is the immediate use CSVs. Back in 2008, this was done only for emergency situations, only for low risk level preparations. It couldn't be more than three commercially uh, manufactured packages or two entries into one container. Uh, of course, you couldn't do any hazard dose. And the compounding had to be continuous, not exceeding one hour, and the administration would begin within one hour of the preparation starting. In 2022 now, the immediate use category was changed a little bit. Now it's prepared from not more than three different sterile products, so it's no longer packages. So for example, uh, if you are reconstituting a vial of Anavip, we know the dose is about 10 vials, that's still considered one sterile product. So again, that definition changed a bit to accommodate those emergency situations. You can prepare hazardous, but you need to comply with USP 800. And the administration must begin within four hours from the start of the preparation. So we went from an hour to four. And the reasoning behind that is that it takes approximately four hours for a contaminant to become adjusted to the environment after introduction into the preparation. So they don't see a lot of proliferation within those first hours. And that's what led to the increase in the time. But you also need to have written operating procedures on aseptic processes of these individuals who will be pre uh, preparing and administering for immediate use. 
and you need to have a uh, personal train to demonstrate competency on a septic technique. The chapter doesn't tell you how and how frequent, but most definitely you need to have this documentation uh, on your facilities. So maybe uh, for hospitals out there, you might need to work with your nursing administrators to make sure that you have those SOPs and competencies in place. Categories of CSPs, of course, also change. Back in 2008, we had low, low risk compounding with 12 hours BUD. We had medium risk and high risk. And now in 2022, we have category one CSPs, which is more or less similar to low risk with 12 hours BUD. Category two CSPs, which need to be prepared in a clean room suite and category three, which also need to be prepared in a clean room suite require sterility testing and endotoxin when applicable. There are more requirements for personal qualifications, um, more uh, sterile garb, sporicidal disinfectant more, used more frequently, more environmental monitoring. And again, we'll talk about this a little later. The chapter also now uh, requires a designated person. And this person, it doesn't have to be just one person, it could be a group of people, but they're ultimately responsible and accountable for the operations, the training and competency of the personnel, the operating procedures, making sure they're um, appropriate, they're implemented, any corrective actions uh, that need to be taking place due to deviations, failures, um, making sure the quality assurance and control program is in place and the overall performance of the compounding facility. And I'm going to now uh, pass it along to Ileana, which is uh, our designated person here, so she can talk to you about uh, personal training, competency, and evaluation. Thank you, Dionysus. So uh, personal training and competency evaluations uh, will include uh, the training and testing. It'll include the media fill and uh, glove figurative testing and sampling as well. So we'll start with an assessment question. A pharmacy technician at XYZ Universal Hospital compounds category two CSPs. How often is this technician's ongoing garbing competency, including glove fingertip and thumb testing and media fill with post glove fingertip thumb and surface sampling done? So here you have three choices, at least every three months, at least every six months, and at least every 12 months. Okay, I'll let you look through that. And we'll start with our um, who must be trained. So in the previous chapter, it was all personnel who would compound CSPs. The new chapter, it indicates a designated person, all compounding personnel, personnel with direct oversight of compounders, personnel compounding immediate use CSPs, and personnel who perform restocking and cleaning in the clean room suites. The core skills portion of the training program in 2008, it indicated that all personnel who prepare CSP must be start their training initially before any compounding begins. Then annually, with low and medium risk level compounding, it would be done annually and semi-annually for high risk level compounding. In the 2022 version of the guidelines, it indicates that the designated personnel, the compounding personnel, and the personnel with direct oversight of compounders were to take this training initially and then every 12 months. Personnel compounding immediate use CSP and personnel who perform restocking and cleaning that training will be determined by the facility's SOPs. The observation and sampling portion of the, uh, got the training program, it includes visual observations of hand hygiene and garbing with glove fingertip and thumb sampling and the media fill with pulse glove fingertip and thumb sampling and surface sampling as well. Initially, it indicates that this training is to be done before any independent uh, compounding begins. And with low and medium risk level compounding, it would be at least annually. And high risk level, it would be semi-annually. The 2022 version indicates that all personnel would be trained initially. 
And then you had the compounders would be trained in the, those that compound in the category one and two would be trained at least every six months. And those that compound in category three would be trained at least every three months. The designated person and personnel with direct oversight of compounders would train at least every 12 months. And again, the compounding immediate use personnel and those that do restocking and cleaning, those would be determined by the facility and documented in the SOPs. One of the noticeable changes that uh, we wanted to point out was the hand hygiene order and the garbing. In the previous version, they indicated that they wanted the garbing order to be from dirtiest to cleanest. That would mean that you would don your foot cover, your shoe covers, I'm sorry, your shoe covers, your head covers, then your uh, head and facial covers, your beard cover, your face mask, and your eye shields. Then it had that you would have to uh, dry your hands and forearm, forearms up to your elbows using either electronic hand dryers or lint-free disposable towels. The 2022 version, focuses more on the garbage orders done, done and doffed in a manner that reduces the risk of contamination. That means that it would require the garbing order, the, it would require for your garb to be protected from any form of contamination. So you would have to make sure that it's, uh, that the area where you're being done and garb is free of any risk of contamination. And then the required garbing must be determined by the facility's SOP and also documented. Hand dryers, the electric hand dryers may not be used in the 2022 version. One other thing that was added was the soap containers must be disposable and cannot be refilled. Therefore, they have to be replaced every time they are emptied. Okay, so let's go back to our assessment question. A pharmacy technician at XYC Universal Hospital compounds category two CSBs. How often is this technician's ongoing garbage competency including the glove fingertip testing and sampling and the media fill with the post glove fingertip and surface sampling done. So if you select it at least every six months, that is the correct answer. So let's discuss the, protect, the personnel protective equipment, our PPE. So our PPE, the minimum garby requirements includes the gowns with sleeves, the shoe covers, the head covers, the facial hair covers and the face mask and eye shields when needed. The previous version just indicated that they had to be non-shedding. With the 2022 version, low lint garb is what's required. In the category three, all low lint outer garb must be sterile. If using the restricted airway uh, barrier systems, your CAI or your C ACI, the disposable gloves should be worn inside the gloves attached to the rab's sleeves. Sterile gloves must be worn over the gloves attached to the rab's sleeves. The reusal of gowns. So the previous version discussed that gowns are allowed to be reused on the same workday. The 2022 version indicates that in category one and two, the gowns may be reused within the same shift by the same person if the gown is maintained in the classified area in a manner that prevents any contamination. For category three, disposable gowns cannot be reused. And if using laundered gowns, they must be re-sterilized and laundered again before use. <laughs> So I'll take it back um, to describe a little bit of the changes in regards to facility and engineering controls. So this is a sample of a clean room suite, uh, the one that we have here at our facility. If you can see, we do have an ISO 7 anteroom servicing both an ISO 7 buffer sterile room and an ISO 7 hazardous buffer sterile room. If you are to be building a new clean room, there is another document by the FDA, it's a draft guidance, but it's called in sanitary conditions at compounding facilities. Uh, we do um, recommend that you read this if you're planning to um, construct a new IV room. One of the examples is that material flow directly between an unclassified area and a room in which the sterile compounding is conducted is an example of insanitary conditions. And they're really talking about the unclassified pass-throughs. 
So you have to be really careful how are you going to do this. It's not mentioned in the USP, but there are other uh, examples of insanitary conditions that are important to um, be on the lookout when you're building your clean rooms. The clean room suite uh, will uh, be used to compound categories two or three CSPs. Again, the air supply to the clean room must be introduced through the HEPA filters, which are located in the ceiling. And this is not a change. It's the same from the 2008 to the 2022 version. But the air returns in the clean room must be low on the walls unless a visual smoke study demonstrate an absence of stagnant airflow. And again, in 2008, this was uh, a recommendation within the chapter, but now is a must. The anteroom must have a line of demarcation and access door should be hands-free. If you're using tacky mats, and we do love those because they do trap a, a lot of particles, you have to make sure you do not place them on ISO classified areas. When it comes to ceilings, walls, doors, counters, cabinets, they must be smooth, impervious, free from crack, non-shedding. Penetrations through the ceiling or walls must be sealed. And one big change here is the sink. It could now be inside or outside the ante area, and it could be on the clean side or the dirty side of the ante area. And this is really what's going to drive your standard operating procedure for gowning, garbing, and hand hygiene. A segregated compounding area. Again, this is an unclassified area, only used for category one CSPs. The area within the PEC should be at least one meter, um, only dedicated for sterile compounding. And if you are going to uh, put the sink inside or near the segregated compounding area, needs to be, must be at least one meter away from the PEC. Ceiling walls, doors, shelvings, they should be smooth, impervious, and non-shutting, but of course it's not a must. So this is an example of a segregated compounding room diagram that we had to put in place when we will, while we were building our IV room. And we wanna make sure you notice the uh, one meter from the sink to the uh, primary engineering control. For the laminar airflow system, the chapter mentions now integrated vertical laminar flow zones. These are allowed, but stat static and dynamic small studies must be performed to verify the continuous flow or HEPA of HEPA filter air. And these studies need to be documented with what we think is gonna be video. The chapter also now talks about robotic enclosures. These are also allowed, but again, you need to have smoke studies attesting that the room air does not enter the PEC during your compounding process. So you gotta make sure you have this proof of documentation when you're being inspected. What we used to think were isolators, they're now called restricted access barrier systems. They can be used for both category one and category two and three CSPs, as long as you place them in a clean room suite. We no longer have that exception that you can have less gowning and garbing if you have a letter from the manufacturer. Even if you're placing it in a class one CSP, you still need to comply with the full garbing requirements of the chapter. Uh, a few must for the rubs is the transfer chamber recovery time. This needs to be documented um, as provided by the manufacturer and you need to have records of documentation that your staff is complying with this recovery time. For temperature and humidity, these are both uh, should within the chapter. Temperature should be maintained at 20 or cooler and humidity at 60% or lower. But in reality, uh, we live in Florida, it's pretty hot, it's humid. So you have to make sure your staff is comfortable uh, with conditions for uh, compounding and you minimize the risk of microbial pr proliferation looking at your environmental monitoring. What's a must within the chapter is that you need to monitor and record those readings as described in your standard operating procedure. The devices that you're using to record the temperature and the humidity need to be verified for accuracy at least every 12 months. 
or as required by the manufacturer, and you have to have proof of these validations and calibrations. For pressure differential between the 2008 and the 2022 version, we noticed that now the readings have an extra decimal point. What it used to be a range in 2008 is now no less than 0 0.020 inches of water columns. And the anti-area remained the same. Uh, in the PAN, the 2008 version of uh, values needed to be reviewed and recorded every shift. Now values need to be reviewed and recorded on the days when compounding is occurring. So if your pharmacy is, is not open every day, you don't have to do these readings daily. For the error exchanges, there's a minor change on the anti-area. It now includes that it needs to be greater or equal to uh, 20 error chambers per hour for your ISO aid. And remember that at least 15 most come um, from the HEPA filter error in the ceilings. Moving to microbiological air and surface sampling changes, we noticed that in the 2008 version, it was really, uh, you know, incubated at a temperature that promotes growth uh, of bacteria and fungi. I talked a little bit about the plates and the temperature ranges, but in the 2022 version is really more detailed. For category one and two, you are to do this at least every six months. But if you're compounding category three, you got to do it monthly. The place that you will be using need to have a certificate of analysis. And the incubation and temperature procedures need to follow box five of the chapter. So take a look because you are going to incubate specifically at a certain temperature for the first 48 hours and then at a different temperature uh, for uh, an additional five days, unless you use a two plate method system, which you could, but you most likely need two incubators. For surface sampling, once again, in the 2008 version, uh, the incubation was for about 72 hours. That has changed. The frequency also changed. It used to be periodically, and now for category one and two is to be done monthly. And if you're compounding category three, you're gonna be doing that at least weekly. Uh, and again, this also must be conducted in conjunction with your media field testing for septic manipulation for your personal training and competency. You still need a certificate of analysis for your media and your incubation and temperature procedures are to follow directions in box six. Once again, this temperature range change and you need to incubate at two different temperatures. So we, of course, procure two incubators, and you can see that it can get pretty crowded. So it's very important that you time your sampling so that you're able to recuperate uh, growth. For action levels, for surface sampling, and in the 2022 version, if you have an ISO class 8 anteroom, your actionable level changed to greater than 50, where it used to be greater than 100. A really notable change from the 2008 to the 22 version is that in the 2008 version, regardless of the number of, C of CFU recover, you still had to identify your place because if you were growing highly pathogenic organisms, you needed to remediate immediately, no matter if you didn't exceed the actual level. But in the 2022 version, this has changed and you, uh, can most certainly identify, but it's not required unless the levels are exceeded. We are going to switch gears back to cleaning and disinfecting. So I'm gonna pass it along to Ileana. Hello again. So cleaning and disinfecting. So in the 2008 version, it indicated cleaning and disinfection is what's required. The 2022 version, it talks about the order of cleaning. So you do the cleaning first and you do the disinfection, followed by the application of sporocidal disinfectant and then your sterile isopropyl alcohol 70%. The frequencies have also changed a bit. So uh, the frequencies for your PECs, your hoods, in 2008, it was at the beginning of each shift and no longer than 30 minutes in between batches. The 2022 version changes that a bit. It's stating that be in, before initiating compounding and on days when compounding occurs. 
So again, if you're not a, a 24 hour pharmacy, you only have to do the cleaning when you are compounding. If the compounding process takes more than 30 minutes, do not interrupt the compounding process to clean. Wait till the, the batch is completed and then you can clean. In the classified areas, the 2008 version talks about cleaning daily. The 2022 version states daily, again, on days when compounding occurs. The application of the sporocidal agent was not addressed in the 2008 version, but with the 2022, it is for the category one and two, the uh, application of the sporocidal detergent would be a monthly process. And then category three, it would be weekly. The cleaning supplies, such as the wipes, the sponges, the pads, and the mop heads, those must be low lint. They should be disposable. And if you're using reusable cleaning tools, they must be dedicated for that use only. Cleaning and disinfecting supplies used in the PECs, they must be sterile. That means that your cleaning agents, your disinfecting agents, your sporocidal disinfectant, your sterile water, and your sterile 70% isopropyl alcohol, those must all be sterile. Tools used inside the PEC must be clean and disinfected prior to use in the PEC. One example is if you're using the easy reach tool, you must disinfect those before. Okay, we'll switch gears to diagnosis and sterilization. All right, so this is uh, very well defined within this chapter now. Um, just a, a couple of terms that I, I want to remind the, the team on the, on the call. Terminal sterilization uh, is done by steam, dry heat, and irradiation, and it assures a probability of non-sterile unit of 10 to the 6. But sterilization by filtration is not terminal sterilization. The chapter called this aseptic processing. And this is important when you're reading your BUGs and how to assign them. The chapter also limited the batch size to 250 final yield units. And if we remember the New England compound in pharmacy, they were batching large amount of products. So once again, this is a limit for uh, compounding, traditional compounding pharmacies not to exceed because then you'll be on the realm of a manufacturer. If you are doing one to 39 units, you're to test 10%. An equal or 40 units will need to be tested according to tables two and three of USP 71. Sterility testing, USP 71, and endotoxin testing, which is USP 85, are not required for category one compounding. But for category two, if you're assigning MBUD that requires a sterility testing, you must do uh, follow the requirements of USP 71 and you have to do endotoxin testing if you're compounding from one or more non-sterile ingredients. Of course, sterility testing is required for category three, and endotoxin if you're compounding for uh, one or more non-sterile ingredients. If you are doing a sterility testing, membrane filtration continues to be the preferred method, and you must perform method suitability tests to make sure that contamination is recovered. For endotoxin limit, uh, you should follow what's described on the CSP monograph, and you must not exceed the endotoxin limit for the appropriate route of administration or for the or target animal or human. So let's get into BUD levels, which is also another notable change within the chapter. Remember that beyond use date is the date after which a CSP must be discarded and not used. It is determined from the date and time the preparation is initiated, not completed. And it does not limit the time the CSP is to be administered because administration is out of the scope of the chapter. It considers both stability and sterility. And there is a few things that uh, really determine the BUD. Not only the chemical and the physical stability, but the container closure system, the compatibility of the product, is it leachable? Is it absorbing to the bag? Are you starting from sterile or non-sterile ingredients? What is your compound env environment? Are you using a clean room suite versus a segregated room? Are you doing just aseptic processing or sterilization? Are you conducting a sterility testing? 
And what is the storage conditions? Are you gonna put it in the refrigerator, room temperature? So all of that takes into account the BUD that you are going to assign to the products. So if you remember back in 2008, uh, a low risk with 12 hours BUD, uh, it was used for segregated compounding areas and you could only store for 12 hours, either at room temperature or refrigeration. With the new changes for category one CSPs, which are uh, prepared in a segregated compounding area, uh, this time, if you're refrigerating the products, you can go up to 24 hours. So that's a good change. If you remember back in 2008, uh, if you were doing low risk compounding, you could store this 48 hours, 14 days refrigerated. For medium risk compounding, it was 30 hours room temperature, nine days refrigerated. And for high risk, which you would start with non-sterile ingredients, it would be 24 hours room temperature and three days refrigerated. So this is a big change within the chapter. It really is determined uh, by several factors. So remember terminally sterilized versus aseptically processed. Well, that's important because that's one of the things that will determine your BUD. So if a sterility testing is not done uh, and you're preparing with only sterile ingredients, you could store these products up to four days at room temperature or 10 days refrigerated. If you are uh, preparing for non-sterile ingredients, you can still do that under category two, but your BUD is reduced to one day room temperature or four days refrigerated. Now, if you're terminally sterilizing your products, dry heat, irradiation, things of that nature, then you can actually extend your BUD up to 60 days in the refrigerator if you're doing a sterility testing. For category three, um, you, again, you can do this aseptically or terminally sterilized, but you need to conduct sterility testing. And not only that, you also need to have all applicable tests for category three pass. And we're talking here about stability indicating analytical methods, such as force degradation studies, following the recommendations of chapter 1225, validating and documenting your results. Only when all of that is conducted, then you can extend your BUD, which it could be up to 90 days at room temperature if you're terminally sterilizing and conducting sterility testing. Something new within the chapter is compounding multiple dose CSPs that was really not very well addressed on the previous chapter. So you can certainly do that now, as long as you're doing them in a category two or three uh, CSP, which is in a clean room suite. The maximum BUD that you can assign these products is 28 days, but they need to go uh, chapter 51 antimicrobial effectiveness testing and container closure system integrity testing, which is chapter 1207. Non-preserved multi-dose acustopical ophthalmic CSPs. This is also a new inclusion within the chapter. And I always remember um, our 45, 45 vancomycin eye drops that we have to prepare for some of our patients here. You can do that. Uh, and antimicrobial effectiveness testing is not required. If you're preparing as a category two or three for a single patient use, labeled to be discarded after 24 hours at room temperature or 72 hours refrigerated. So those are some of the good changes within the chapter, a, a lot of clarification there. The chapter also talks about conventionally manufactured single dose containers. These could be punctured and used within your ISO class five primary engineering control up to six hours. The chapter now change, you could use it up to 12 hours, but you must respect the labeling storage requirements of the product. So if a product needs to be refrigerated, that is the preferred conditions for the product, you can put it back in the refrigerator and you can have, it would have an e use time of 12 hours. And as long as you're puncturing within your ISO class five, you can store the product in the refrigerator for 12 hours. The chapter also talked about conventionally manufactured bulk packages, 
uh, back in 2008, it could only be penetrated one. Now it's telling you to follow the manufacturer's labeling recommendations. For compounding single dose CSPs as stock solutions, and we see this a lot in pediatric uh, compounding, the BUD also changed to 12 hours. So as long as you're using that stock solution, um, you can have it in your hood for about 12 hours. And one good thing about this is that the in-use time does not limit the BUD of the final CSP. So an example, you're preparing a dilution of gentamicin to pull several doses. That gentamicin stock solution might be good for 12 hours, but the uh, syringes that you're preparing for your patients, those um, will be assigned a BUD according to the chapters, which could be up to nine days refrigerated, if the, 10 days now, if the um, stability allows it for. Regarding standard operating procedures, SOPs and documentation, um, really you need to have an SOP for garbage and hand hygiene. You need to have documentation of personal training, competency assessment, qualifications and validations. Have to make sure you have your certification report results and these are available for inspection, which includes smoke studies and corrective actions your environmental monitoring results, the review of these results on any cap analysis that you may have done, your equipment records, right? So the maintenance that you did for your incubators or your equipment that you use. If you're doing sterilization, deparogenation, and endotoxin um, tests, you really have to have documentation of verification. Uh, your monitoring reports, temperature, humidity, pressure differential, incubator temperatures, SOPs for components received and handling, the records of cleaning, disinfecting and sporicidal application, master formulation records and compounding records, all those documents are required for the chapter now. And the SOPs must be communicated to the staff and must be reviewed every 12 months. Differences between master formulation records versus compounding records. A master formulation record is required for any CSP prepared from non-sterile ingredients. And if you're doing batch compounding or preparing for more than one patient, you will also need a master formulation record. Compounding records though, they're required for all compounding, whether it's category one, two, or three, you need to have a compounding record. Even if you're doing immediate use CSP, but you're preparing for more than one patient, you need to have a compounding record. Now the record can be in the form of a prescription, a medication order or label, and they can be stored electronically. So you can have your MFRs and your workflow management systems. As long as they're retrievable and contain all the information, the chapter allows it. Quality assurance and control is also uh, mentioned throughout the chapter. And again, it's really to build on a robust program that will ensure safe compounding practices. Records and quality of your trainings, your SOPs, your MFRs, your compounding records. Again, making sure those environmental testing and monitorings are reviewed, your calibrations, your release infections, any complaints or ADRs needs to be investigated, corrective actions documented and available for inspection. Our final recommendations, November 1st is around the corner. If you haven't done so, please start your gap analysis, making sure you know where you are versus where you need to be. Start training because it there are some changes that the staff need to be aware. Uh, the staffing requirements, you may need more staff, you might need to work on your budget, you now require sterile uh, cleaning products where maybe you didn't have to before, so your financials are important. And once again, this chapter is just the minimum standards. There is definitely uh, a lot more than you can do to ensure that our patients are safe. Um, remember these preparations. Uh, are not checked by the FDA or any other regulatory agency and our patients trust that what we're doing is safe for them. So Bill, with that, I'm gonna head it back to you um, just to see if there are any questions from the audience. 
Great, thank you, Dionysus and Ileana. That was excellent. Appreciate you uh, very much condensing all of that down to the key changes from 2008 to, to 2022. Uh, that was excellent. I will let everybody know that um, both this video as well as the slides uh, will get posted onto the FSHP website. Uh, that should be posted by the end of next week, probably a little bit earlier, but uh, at the latest by the end of next week. If anybody wants to drop in a question into the chat, feel free. We can go ahead and uh, ask uh, the questions um, if you want to post them in there. Everybody attending uh, will get a link to an evaluation that will be active until July 5th. So please complete that in order to be able to get CE. This has been accredited for one hour of CE. Um, I don't see any questions in there currently. Um, I do have one question actually that I have, which is on the uh, on the competency assessment where you can break it down between those who are actual compounders versus those who don't compound. For instance, checkers, it said that uh, the organization can define that. Is there a minimum to that? Um, could I define it to be say every other year or does it still have to be at least once a year? Uh, when you're talking about, you're talking about the training for the compounders? No, for 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 non-compounders, say for you know those who might just be checking but never will actually compound, where the organization can define how often the competency must be used. Um, is there a minimum to that? So if I define that to be say every other year, would that be okay? The minimum that's uh, recommended is every at least every twelve months. Right, but the, that minimum every 12 months is, is for those that are actively compounding or for, sorry, for the designated person on the person who oversees personnel. Right. Compounding personnel is every six months, but you're right, Bill. The chapter really is not descriptive as to uh, what the facilities are going to be implemented. Uh, I can give you my personal opinion on, on that is that you know, you need to, everybody needs to have some level of understanding and how you decide that's going to be, if it's going to be every year, every two years, upon hire, that's really up to the organization and your facility. There's really no guidance, but just remember this chapter is a minimum standard and, and you can certainly do more and be more proactive and provide this information annually or every two years as you feel, as you feel comfortable as a designated person for your site. Great, thank you. Um, there are a few questions that have popped in. Um, one question is, is, is there a current gap analysis tool that is available that you know of? There are a few gap analysis out there. Um, ASHP actually has a, a compounding form which really describes the changes uh, and how to get ready for implementation. I really suggest you you go into that uh, uh, ASHP forum. It's, it's called ASHP Compounders. And I don't know if you used it, Bill. I find it very useful. And you create your own gap analysis from there. And I know there's a couple out there that um, some institutions are using. But really, there is no better exercise than doing it yourself and looking at the chapter, looking at what is changing, and really assessing what uh, what's happening at your facility. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question is, if nurses compound in physician clinics, will they need to have competencies? So the scope of the chapter applies to clinics as well. So if you are doing immediate use compounding or um, not necessarily following the labeling recommendations, you do need to have some kind of SOP and training of a septic technique. That's our interpretation of the chapter. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, is Florida going to adopt these new standards when they become official? And I guess when he says Florida, the Board of Pharmacy, uh, there has not been a law that says there's going to be a change, but um, what will the Board of Pharmacy do? So I suggest that you pay close attention to uh, those Board of Pharmacy meetings. They're uh, really the compounding subcommittee is reviewing uh, the new chapter and uh, revising the 797, but um, 
I will ask that you please follow the effort, the Department of Health and the Florida Board of Pharmacy uh, meeting minutes to um, keep you uh, informed of what changes are coming. Yeah, and I, I would just say I, I would expect that they will uh, plan for them to do that. Uh, and then if there are perhaps certain things like, uh, you know, the air return being at the on the bottom of the wall, perhaps that might be out of scope for them since the board cannot mandate certain um, renovations or constructions that are over a particular cost. We'll see what happens with some of those things, um, but just plan for them. I would expect them. And then remember to joint commission, of course, is out there too. And um, they can certainly uh, enforce to the full extent. So uh, next question is, is there a provider for clean room documentation forms? Seems like some of the documentation is new. Not sure I quite understand that. Is there a provider for clean room documentation forms? Uh, so the, the chapter is not really descriptive into how are, are you gonna have this documentation? Is it gonna be electronic versus a form? Um, I can tell you that at our facility, we use an electronic um, compliance system there are a few out there. Um, um, definitely, you can research for electronic uh, sterile compounding compliance softwares. Um, you can build the form, uh, you know, for for what you're trying to do. If you want to do something manual, but um, I would suspect um, a lot of um, compounders out there will use an electronic format to be able to be easily retrievable and, and printed out for an inspector. There is a, a question there about including personnel that check IVs versus camera, via cameras. Uh, I, I think the question is, is how often should they have a competency? And uh, well, if, if you are a person overseeing compounding personnel, I believe the chapter's dictates uh, is every 12 months. Okay, thank you. Uh, for those who only restock or clean the IV room suite, must they be trained, assessed in compounding or just on the component of the job they are performing? So they must be trained um, for whatever it is that the activity they're going to be performing. But I would say most definitely they will need um, hand hygiene, garbing, uh, gowning and garbing. That is the minimum requirement for anybody entering a compounding room. So anybody who's walking into a control compounding area needs to have uh, records of gowning, garbing, hand hygiene. And then of course you'll train that person into whatever the role it is that they'll be performing. How often, that's not defined by the chapter. Excellent, thank you. It looks like that's all the questions that we have. Um, so again, uh, watch out for your emails. You'll be getting an email with a link to the CE survey. So you'll wanna go ahead and complete that. Uh, real quick also, just a quick plug for the FSHB annual meeting. Hopefully we'll be seeing everybody out there where we can continue to have uh, this discussion and, and talk with one another about how everybody is working towards compliance with this. So um, it's at the Gaylord Palms Resort, which is an excellent location. So look forward to being able to see everybody there. Uh, well, again, thank you, Dionysus. Thank you, Ileana. That was excellent. A great review in comparison, again, to uh, the, the changes. Again, this will be put onto the FSHP website where you'll have the full video as along with the slides as well that will be available. So the slides will be an excellent reference for everybody too. Thank you, thank Bill, you. for the opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, thanks again, everybody. And we wish everybody to have a good night. And uh, thank you. Thank you all. Have a great evening.